Hi, welcome to J Sweat Plastic Surgery. I'm Dr. Jeffrey Sweat. You're being asked to watch this video today as a general introduction to the practice. It is our goal here that you are taken care of in a state-of-the-art facility, but also that we make sure that you're comfortable and that all of your questions are answered. This is definitely a team approach. As an individual surgeon who operates anywhere from three to four days a week, I rely on my team around me to help with your care throughout the entire process. I've also surrounded myself by people who are highly educated about what we do, so oftentimes they will answer your questions. If you have any questions that they can't answer, obviously they'll talk to me and we'll make sure that we have all of your questions answered. But it is important to understand that it is a team approach, and oftentimes throughout the surgical process you will interface with me from time to time, but you will often interface with my staff more frequently than you do with me. And this is so that we make ourselves available to you at all times and any time that you have problems. Obviously, we will provide you with an emergency number that you can call after hours, but when our office is open, it is always best to call the office to get the fastest response. If you have any questions or concerns about the process and how we are taking care of you as a patient here at J Sweat Plastic Surgery, please don't hesitate to ask. Thank you and welcome to the practice. When it comes to breast implant surgery, there are a lot of decisions that need to be made. The first and most basic decision is what type of an implant are we going to use? There are two basic types of implants, those that are filled with silicone gel and those that are filled with salt water or saline. When it comes to the saline filled implants, the shell of the implant is the same regardless. It is a silicone shell, whether it's filled with silicone or whether it's filled with salt water. The advantage of the saline filled implants is that since we are, our bodies are made of salt water, if you develop a hole in the shell of a, a saline implant, the saline will simply leak out and the implant will go flat like a tire and thus your breast will deflate. You'll wake up one morning and one breast will be smaller than the other. Thus the implant has told you that it is broken and there's no need to screen for implant breakage. The downside of that is you have breasts now that are two different sizes and you're going to have to do something relatively quickly in order to be able to change that. With a silicone filled implant, the idea behind the silicone is that it is made of a consistency of gel so that if the implant breaks, the gel does not leak out. That's why when the FDA brought them back on the market in 2006, they recommended a screening MRI at three years after placement and every two years after that for the rest of your life to check to see whether or not the implant's broken. That recommendation is one that nobody follows. It's overkill. The implant itself um, can break at any time after placement. It's not a ticking time bomb. It doesn't explode after a certain amount of time. The implants themselves are guaranteed for a lifetime so that if you ever develop a broken implant, the manufacturer will replace the implant at no charge to you. If the implant breaks within the first 20 years after placement, you'll get a free implant plus financial assistance to replace the implant. That used to be a 10 year warranty. So people got in their minds that the implants had to be replaced or exchanged every 10 years. That's not true. Again, it doesn't explode after a certain amount of time. It could break at six months after placement or 60 years after placement. But it is important to understand that the implant is not designed for a lifetime. And thus, once you go down the implant route, this may not be the last operation that you have ever have on your breasts. My personal recommendation would be that you get a screening MRI at any time if you're having problems with the implants, again, whether it's six months after placement or 20 years after placement. However, if you're not having problems with the device, I would still recommend that you check a screening MRI at about 19 or 19 and a half years after placement to check to see whether or not the implant is broken. If I, as a plastic surgeon, ever know that the implant is broken, I'm going to recommend that it be removed and potentially replaced. If you check it while you're still within that warranty period, you'll get a free implant for replacement plus financial assistance to return to the operating room to exchange the implant. After 20 years, if you're not having problems, I wouldn't go looking for problems. The difference between the silicone implants that were taken off the market in the early 90s and the silicone implants that are on the market today is the thickness or consistency of the silicone gel. With the newer implants, again, it is designed to be more of a gel versus the consistency of the old implants was more of the consistency of honey. And you'll know if you pour honey on the counter, over time it will spread out and become a sticky mess on the counter versus the consistency of the implants that are newer are more the consistency of free cheese, which will slowly flatten out over time. The reason that that is important is because with the old implants, the silicone could get outside of the shell or capsule, which is scar tissue that forms around the implant, and it could mix with breast tissue, which could cause hard lumps of the breast, which mimics breast cancer. That's why we always recommended that the old silicone implants be removed and then potentially replaced. We don't have enough experience with the newer implants to know whether or not that's going to be a problem, but the design is such that that would not be the case. But again, if I ever know that the implant is broken, I'm gonna recommend that it be removed and replaced. So, 
That is one problem that we have with the implants is breakage with time. A second problem that we have with the implants is that they can develop scar tissue around the implant itself. If you've ever heard about someone who got hard implants, the implants themselves never got hard. What happened is your body forms scar tissue around the implant. That scar tissue can contract down against the implant. In other words, the scar tissue forms a tight shell around the implant and contracts against it, which can make the implant seem very hard. Using an implant that is smooth and placed underneath the muscle helps to decrease the risk of that scar tissue forming. Placing the implant around the nipple also increases the risk of that scar tissue forming. So generally, we'll make an incision underneath the breast if we're only going to do a breast augmentation and place the implant in underneath the muscle. Again, the muscle helps to decrease the chance of the scar tissue forming and it also helps to hold the implant into the position that we want it to be in. The implant is never completely covered by the muscle. There's an area down and out to the side where you'll be able to feel the implant underneath the breast tissue. And it's only the breast tissue and soft tissue that is supporting the weight of the implant. And that then leads to one of the other problems that we can have with implants. The larger the implant, the more gravity is going to pull on the implant with time. So over time, the implant can drop lower than what we'd like to see it. Or if you lay down, it can fall off to the side. Usually women who are going for breast implant surgery want a nice round full um, upper pole of the breast. And if the implant drops lower than what we'd like it to be, then they can lose that upper pole fullness. Again, the larger the implant, the more problems that we have with that. We also have problems in people who have had massive weight loss where their tissue has been stretched out with time. And occasionally I'll recommend that we put in a reinforcing material to help hold the implant into the position that we want it to be in. So again, we can have problems with scar tissue forming around the implants. We can also have positional problems with the implants. The implants can stay too high, drop too low, or fall off to the side when you're lying down. Even though I put the implants exactly where I want them to be, over time, the implant will migrate around and your body heals the way it wants to. So there is a risk that we could have to come back to do further surgery to change that. The other thing that we worry about with the implants is infection. If an implant gets infected, which usually happens within the first couple weeks after surgery, unfortunately your body cannot fight that infection because the infection is on a foreign body and the blood supply can't get to the implant to be able to fight that infection. Thus, usually we have to do another surgery to remove the implant, allow the infection to go away, and then come back later and replace the implant, which can mean further surgery and expense every time we have to return to the operating room in order to do more surgery. We talked about placing the implant underneath the muscle to help to decrease the risk of scar tissue forming. We have found in studies over time that if the implant is placed over the muscle, underneath the breast tissue, we generally typically will choose a textured implant to help to decrease the risk of scar tissue forming around the implant. The risk of scar tissue forming in the first place should be less than 10%, but unfortunately it does require further surgery in order to treat that scar tissue, which means you have to be taken to surgery, the scar tissue has to be completely cut out, and then we put in a fresh implant and hope that your body doesn't recognize the fresh implant like it did the old implant. Unfortunately, if capsular contracture happens in the first place, there's at least a 50% chance of it coming back even with further surgery. Again, most commonly we will place the implant underneath the muscle, which helps to camouflage the implant. It also helps to decrease the risk of the scar tissue forming with time, and it also helps to hold the implant into the position that we want it to be in. The downside of placing the implant under the muscle is that if you do something that contracts the pectoral muscle, it will push the implant to the side and it will make your breast look funny. That's a normal side effect of breast, putting the breast implant underneath the muscle. That's called an animation deformity. Once you relax the pectoral muscle, it will fall back into normal position and it'll look like it did before. We also, um, when it comes to implants, uh, we have several different choices in terms of the shape of the implant or whether or not it has a texturing. I already mentioned one of the reasons why we use a textured implant is to help to decrease the risk of scar tissue when the implant is placed over the muscle rather than under the muscle. Another time in which we choose a textured implant is when the implant itself has a shape to it. This is a smooth round silicone filled breast implant. It has a round base and a round shape on its side. This is a textured implant that also has a shape to it. If you hold it up, you'll see that it has more of a natural teardrop shape. So for women who wanna have a breast augmentation or breast enhancement and would like a more natural result, we use a textured shaped implant. That shape, again, there's less fullness at the top and more at the bottom, which mimics more of a natural breast shape. In this case, the texturing helps to prevent the implant from rotating. So it acts as sort of a Velcro to hold the implant into the position that we want it to be in. If we don't use a shaped implant, we almost always use a smooth round implant and again place it into the submuscular position. One of the reasons that we tend to shy away from texturing is that over the last few years we have identified 
a new type of cancer that we believe is associated with the texturing of the implants. It's called breast implant associated anaplastic large cell lymphoma. It's not a breast cancer, it's a type of lymphoma and we believe that it happens because of the texturing on the implants. Usually that will manifest itself years after the implant's placed by a sudden swelling of one of the breasts um, and fluid accumulation around the breasts. The treatment for this is to remove the implant and all of the scar tissue and that's usually curative. But again, this is only something that we've found out most recently and we don't entirely understand why it happens. The manufacturer that seemed to have the highest risk of the BIA-ALCL with their texturing has actually removed their implants from the market. Through their studies, we believe that the risk of BIA-ALCL with the textured implants could be as high as 1 in 3,000, which, to put it into perspective, a woman's risk for developing breast cancer over the course of her lifetime would be 1 in 8. So it's still a very rare problem, and again, we've taken the implants off the market that we feel are the biggest culprit for causing this problem. But in general, usually we'll tend to stay away from a texture implant unless there's a reason to use the texturing. The other thing that you'll read about in the literature that has become a new controversy, actually it's an old controversy that has come about again. The reason that the implants were taken off the market in the early 90s is because that we thought that the implants were causing health problems in women, um, most specifically autoimmune problems. The implants were removed from the market while multiple studies were done to check to see about the safety of the implants. This, we found through multiple studies that the risk of autoimmune problems in the unimplanted or non-implanted population was the same as the people who got implants or the people who had implants. Thus, we found no cause and effect to show that this is the case. To date, we don't have any studies that show that breast implant illness is something that actually exists, but there certainly is a subset of women who have their implants removed and feel much better after the removal of the implant. We simply don't have a study that proves that it exists or doesn't exist, but it is something that you need to be concerned about when considering breast implants. The other thing, and I've mentioned this before, the implants are not lifetime devices. There are multiple different reasons why you may have further surgery on your breasts, whether it's capsular contracture, positional problems, rupture of the implant, infection of the implant, perhaps you're gonna change from one style of implant to another, or a saline implant to a silicone implant, or vice versa. The risk of reoperation on all women who are simply having a breast augmentation surgery, in other words, the only surgery they're having on the breast is to enhance it with an implant, the risk of reoperation within the first 10 years after placement is one in five or 20%. You can imagine that if we're doing a breast lift associated with the implant or other complicated breast surgery, the risk of reoperation increases from there. The surgery itself um, carries the same risks as all any other surgery. There's the risk of bleeding, infection, and scarring anytime we do surgery. Specifically to the breast, there can be change in nipple sensation, increase, decrease, or loss of nipple sensation. Because especially if we're doing a breast lift and we're changing the position of the nipple from one position to another, we're placing a scar all the way around the implant and cutting the nerve and blood supply, which can affect the both the sensation or sensitivity of the nipple, and it can also affect the viability of the nipple. In other words, we could lose a nipple. That's a very low risk, but it is something to take into consideration. Breasts are almost never symmetric, and it's very uncommon for women to start out perfectly symmetric. It's important to understand that if perfect symmetry doesn't exist to start with, it most likely is not going to exist afterwards. A little bit of breast asymmetry is very natural and it happens virtually in all of the people who have breast surgery. So it is important to understand that perfect symmetry is not something that we're going for, but we simply want to make it as close as we possibly can. And so that visually, especially when you're wearing clothing, there's no difference in the appearance of the breasts. Other risks associated with the surgery, other than change in nipple sensation or sensitivity of the nipple itself or the breast, there's the risk of lumpiness of the breast tissue. And again, the implants will stay very high at first when they're placed underneath the muscle, and then it takes them time to settle down over time and ultimately develop their final shape. Usually, if we're considering a breast revision surgery, we'll wait at least six months to a year to allow the breast to completely heal and get our final result before we go in and make any changes to it. The surgery itself is done as an outpatient surgery. You're going to come in the morning of surgery and go home that same day. It's done under a general anesthetic, which means that you're gonna go off to sleep for the surgery. When you wake up, you'll be in a supportive soft cotton sports bra that we will provide for you. That sports bra is to be worn day and night for six weeks after surgery. I would encourage you to take it easy when you get home from surgery. No heavy lifting or aerobic activity. In fact, activity restrictions are to be extended for six weeks after surgery. No heavy lifting or aerobic activity, nothing that really joggles the breast for about six weeks after surgery. 
even though I ask for you to take it easy when you get home, it is super important that you're up moving around as soon as possible after surgery. When you get home, you should get up, move around the house, get up, go to the bathroom, get yourself something to eat, but just be up moving around at least every hour or so after surgery. You don't have to do it at night while you sleep, but it is important that you're up moving around. If you're lying around too much, there's a risk of developing blood clots in your legs. Those can travel to your heart and lungs and that can be fatal. So we don't wanna have that happen. It is super important that you're up moving around after surgery. If you have any questions or concerns about anything that I've said in this educational video, please ask me. Mm -hmm.